What's up socials, welcome back to my channel. I wanted to chat today about vlogging. I know we talk about it all the time here, but I find that in the comments, you guys are always sharing what you think and the questions that you have. And sometimes there are questions and ideas that are what I would call a little bit dated or just things I've talked about in the past that I really want you to know and I, I would like to say as many times as possible so you don't make some of the same mistakes that a lot of people have made over the years in video. There's just so much information out there now. You know, why not skip to the fun part and learn those things that a lot of people had to do on their own, figure out on their own when there wasn't as much access to this kind of information. So I thought the fastest and easiest way to explain this is to go through some of the advice that I've learned as a vlogger over time that I wish I would have known at the beginning. I mean, if I was starting today, these are things I would want to know immediately whether I knew to ask the question or not. Like I said, we talk about video all the time here, so if you're interested in that or video blogging, you're just sort of discovering it or you're working on fine tuning your skills, make sure you subscribe to this channel because I make new videos every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, and a lot of them are about vlogging. But let's dive into some vlogging advice that I wish I had when I first started. Showing to tell a story is much more interesting than just telling a story. It seems like the word storytelling is passed around a lot because it's effective if you do it right. There's a lot of companies doing this, there's a lot of people doing this, and everybody has their own way of storytelling, but people forget the power of video. It's not just sitting down and talking to a camera. It can be, and that can absolutely work all on its own, but the more you can show to tell, you can actually fill in a lot of blanks for people who are visual learners or who are having a hard time understanding the dots that you're trying to connect. So something I wish I would have learned a little bit sooner is just leveraging visuals in any way possible, whether it's just titles that you can integrate into video or going and getting B-roll, just like visual video that's meant to be overlaid on top of somebody talking, anything visual, photos, even just today you can download your Instagram story and integrate it into your video. All of these visuals help to show the story you're trying to tell and like I said, can connect those dots. So doing that, oh my goodness, it's amazing how much further into the commitment of a story that a viewer can be when you do that, rather than just relying on the words coming out of your mouth. I also kind of find it fun telling a story, using visuals to tell a story, but not always filling in some of the blanks. Do you ever feel like that sometimes where you're watching a movie and you're just like, just tell her, or like somebody's leaving out a specific detail that you know if she knew she would understand. There are so many blanks you could fill in like a movie or a TV show, but often they don't because it keeps the attention of the viewer and sort of the drama extends. That is really fun. Once you've kind of hacked that as a video storyteller, certainly in vlogging, that's where your videos can get really fun and extremely addictive for the viewer. There's always more video you can get. There's always more visuals that you can grab to tell a story. So do that so that you have to do a better job of showing to tell. Great video is just as much in audio as it is visual. We talked about this a couple of, I guess, weeks ago in that tutorial I did on jump cutting. I think the aha moment for a lot of people watching that is that if you really pay attention to what I do in the audio line of jump cutting sometimes, it keeps you more entertained audibly than you would anticipate having to rely strictly on the visual. So where we just talked about showing to tell and how that can keep things very interesting to the eye, there's also things you can do with audio that fill in the blank, so to say. Very basic way of taking this whole advice into consideration is if you have bad audio, you're gonna lose people on the video. So that's why we talk about things like using microphones or trying not to be outside if it's too windy and unreliable for the audio, because if you screw that up, you will lose someone for the entire experience of your video. Just one moment of cringe for audio is bad. That's just the beginning of it though, because you have to have good audio, but also if you can get really creative with audio in ways where someone might only pick up on it if they were really listening. I kind of want to compare it to like NPR podcasts. They put you in the setting they want you in by 
playing audio of the background for a second just so you can hear it. What do the people sound like or what are the sounds in the atmosphere just so you can hear it. And then sort of the, the person interviewing or the person telling the story will come over top of that. And so because you're listening to that, you have you know no other choice. If you actually do that with a video, you might find out that your favorite vloggers are doing a lot more on that side of the video than you realize because you're paying attention to a lot more than just the audio. Man, can you do some really fun stuff with audio? I'm kind of all over the place with like that creativity level of what you can do. It's almost like subliminal messaging. Like what could you do with audio in a video? <laughs> I guess we're not going that far, but really could get very interesting. But I, I think it just goes back to that jump cut video I was saying. Think about audio as an opportunity to keep the story flowing for the viewer so that they're not getting bored in their ears. Because if they get bored in their ears, there's a chance you could lose them on the video side too. Google AdSense is not the only basket you should be putting your eggs into. It's very easy early on as a vlogger on YouTube to say, oh, this is great. You upload video, you sign up for Google AdSense, and once you can be monetized, which is after 10,000 views as a new channel today on YouTube, then you make money on your videos. I've had people come up to me at conferences and ask me what my CPM is, and I'm like, what are you talking about? If Google AdSense was the only thing I counted on paying my bills, I would not be here right now. That's probably why a lot of people give up, which is exactly why this is advice anybody should get when they're first starting. Sure, I may have had this thought process in the beginning, but even when I started, it was much more difficult to become a part of the partner program on YouTube, which is the only way you could have monetized videos with Google AdSense. So I knew to get more creative early on anyway, because I wasn't a part of a partner program, I wasn't signed with a network, anything like that. But still, it's wild to me how many people still think that this is like the way to make money on YouTube. There are so many other ways you can make money. I mean, I just saw a Patreon closed another incredible round. That's been helping people monetize their presence on any platform online, it's definitely YouTube. But merchandise and um, just selling your product or getting sponsors, there's so many other ways to monetize and you should absolutely be entertaining anything that makes sense for you, the type of work you do, and how you're best at serving a customer so that you can give them the best product. Whether that customer is a sponsor and you need to make money on your content. So how do you align that sponsor? You have to be amazing at that to make that work. Regardless of what that is, Google AdSense is not the only thing you can do to monetize videos, period. I think people are more aware of that now, especially with how much talk there has been of other platforms coming into play. How are they helping creators to monetize? What flexibility do they offer, etc. I still think YouTube is the most flexible of any to monetize in a lot of different ways, but you must diversify that portfolio you should not have one paycheck. I mean, if that's what you were doing, just go to a regular job. Like, why are you even trying to make money with this? Just have fun. Personality is far more important than perfection. This is really difficult, I think, for a lot of people in the beginning. Today, it's so easy because we have phenomenal cameras in our smartphones, and so it's a lot easier to kind of make it feel perfect. But even somebody can get into their own head and say, my phone isn't good enough, I have to have top of the line everything. And we think the camera is gonna solve the problem, but it's not. It's really not. If you suck, at talking to the lens of a camera, mostly because you just haven't identified the camera as a vehicle for your message, then your videos are just gonna be terrible. I mean, if you can't do this on a basic level, I would argue you can't even tell a good story not talking to a camera either. You really have to get the other person that's watching this. And that's where personality comes into play. I don't think you have to have the personality to be on camera. I certainly never had the personality to do anything showy. I just decided that what I wanted to do was important enough to talk about and so I started talking about it. That just comes from talent and I talk about that and how do you become talented on video. I have a video talking about that. But the personality, the person that takes the viewer through this experience on video, they are going to save everything else from imperfection. So if you have any camera laying around that you must use and it's not perfect but it works and you make sure there are no sounds in your 
place where you're filming so that your audio can be the best possible it can be, even if you can't afford the equipment yet. If you can sit here and take someone into an experience where they feel like they're sitting there with you and, and you're educating them or entertaining them or any of those things, you're golden. That could get you through forever. I mean, look at all the people that became popular from Vine. That was absolutely smartphone only. <laughs> and people can do some really amazing things was something so simple, but if it wasn't for the people, none of it would have landed as well as it did. It's the people that bring people into the experience and take them through and make them feel like they're hanging out. Personality is not the thing you have to have coming into it, but it is the thing that someone watching is going to be paying attention to, to feel like they belong. Be respectful with monetization to both your audience and yourself. We talked about this a little bit. I think this is always on people's mind because they realize that if they actually have a forte in this, that they're very good or they're very creative, that their thing, their project, their product could be worth money. And so therefore you should absolutely be allowed to make money at what you do. I mean, yeah, obviously. We don't have to put all of our eggs in one basket. We can have lots of options, but we also sort of have to present a couple of things when you're getting started with this, especially if you don't have experience in charging for what you do, especially if you report to a regular job, you're not used to having to deal with that conversation, you just get a paycheck. Couple of things here. Some people are afraid to monetize at the beginning, whether it's just normal ads on YouTube or incorporating a sponsor or asking for Patreon dollars or whatever it is, they're afraid to do that because they don't wanna isolate their audience, which is completely understandable because if you were not respectful about it if you were doing it in a way that seemed a little disconnected from your brand then yeah your audience is probably gonna go what is going on here but you can't not monetize because you are deathly afraid of that or you're afraid that the comments are gonna say you're a sellout because there's always that one kid that says you're a sellout like because they're kind of pissed that they can't sell out because they don't know how but the ones who are a part of your community and they understand you and they understand the way you tick if your monetization strategy aligns with that and you present it in a way that actually is going to be valuable for them, they usually don't have a big problem with it. And you're actually worse off making yourself suffer without monetization because you're worried about the isolation issue. Because if you suddenly introduce this idea of making money much later on, no one's, no one's understanding where this is coming from and you still have no idea what you're doing because you never really grasped the, the idea of talking about money with your community, then it's gonna be caught totally off guard and you'll have a much larger audience that could potentially make a stink about it. You have to have this conversation early and often. You have to be completely transparent about what your goals are because they'll see right through it. So the more you do that, you could actually have things fare very well with making money. I'm always extremely transparent about the fact that there are affiliate people that I work with, companies that pay me. If you decide to sign up with them on for whatever service or product, product that they have, I'm not gonna talk about it though, unless it's something I believe in or something that I use. Because if I don't, then you guys are gonna see right through that, you know. But if I do use it, and you're my best friend, like I'm gonna tell you exactly what I'm down with. Like, here's where I'm shopping, here's what I'm buying, here's the thing I can't live without. I mean, I can't believe I haven't gone through my skincare routine because that seems to be my second best friend. But the reality is, I'm going to tell you something because of how it has changed my life. That's the only reason why I'm here. So being transparent about that means I can bring in an affiliate or I can bring in a sponsor that if they're aligned with that story and I say, I'm gonna vet you and make sure you're good for my community first, then it's all gonna be kosher. But if you're not transparent about that, you're not being fair to yourself. And that's how some of the best creators end up falling off because they just can't sustain it. They can't sustain what they love. And that's so unfortunate to me. I just think that that's awful. And it's because they never really had a good sit down talk from anyone about the fundamentals of making money and how to do it the right way and not the shady way. So be aware of your audience and what makes sense for them and don't walk all over them because they will put a stop to that. But do not be unfair to yourself because you are afraid of the conversation. Thumbnails matter period. This is probably a little specific to YouTube, but also not really because it happens on other social networks where thumbnails come in very handy. But on YouTube, as a video creator, somebody decides to watch your video based on 
two things, a title, and a thumbnail. Now we're starting to see some really interesting sort of like graphics when you hover over a video and it sort of plays in like a, a GIF sort of format, what the video might look like. But the thumbnail is that big visual thing that people make a decision on when they wanna watch a video. One visual connection after you did all this work with video and audio and being awesome and editing and YouTube cards and all this kind of stuff. If you don't nail the thumbnail, that's a nail in the coffin for that video. That should be a social media graphic quote somewhere. Also, thumbnails are useful on things like Facebook because some people's Wi-Fi stalls sometimes and you don't want some like weird visual of your face that Facebook stole from YouTube strategy because you didn't upload a thumbnail. So even the other social networks really need this kind of thing right now, but YouTube is where they literally look at a photo to decide to watch your video. You have to think very carefully about every square, millimeter of that thumbnail and what people are thinking when they see it and how it might be answering the question that is being posed to them in the headline to bring it full circle to make them go, I gotta watch that. Thumbnails matter, period. Oh man, I wish I would have really dissected that early on. God, that's a big one. Every single video gets better. It is amazing how much you can grow over time. I, I get the question a lot, should I delete my old videos? I'm so much better now, I've got design, I've got help, I've got a nice camera, should I delete my old videos? Well, first of all, if you really hate your old videos, thumbnails matter, period. <laughs> Go back and replace all those thumbnails. Solved. Because if the videos actually do serve a purpose and they help the same community that you're trying to build, then why waste those archives? I love when people go watch all my old stuff and go, whoo, you've gotten better. Yeah, I know. I don't like watching my old stuff that much. I've got a lot of videos I love on my channel. I've got a lot of videos that I just kind of like, but I was like, eh, I wish I could have changed a couple things here and there. I definitely made a mistake on that camera setting. Definitely made a mistake on that video. Definitely made a mistake on the lighting or the audio, whatever. There's a million things but every single video gets better because you are going to be hard up to make some of the same mistakes again when you see what they've done to you. And you're like, oh, I have to publish this, but I'm not gonna do that on the next one. I will make sure I don't screw that up on the next one. And sometimes you do and it's fine, but every video still gets better. So just get over it. Publish the thing, make the archive, I would not be here today if I was deleting 50% of my 750 some videos. No. Do not spend so much time overanalyzing your videos and how you wish that they were better because they're getting better every time, guaranteed, unless you're a complete idiot. <laughs> and you watch yourself back and you're like, that's terrible, let's do it again. <laughs> you're not pretty sure you're not. Well, those are seven pieces of advice that I wish I would have had when I got started. Hopefully this was a good pep talk for you if you're sort of in a weird place, feeling stalled, or you haven't gotten started with video. But if you would like to keep on trucking through this, I would love to help you with that. Make sure you subscribe to this channel because I do make new videos all the time about this. And uh, don't worry, we'll get through it together because I have been through the ringer. Specifically, more vlogging advice can be found in Vlog Like a Boss, the YouTube playlist. I will link that above and it will be in the description as well. And also my book, Vlog Like a Boss. You can check that out and that would probably be useful to you as well. That's all for today's socials. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it as always. Make sure you subscribe for good vibes and keep on vlogging so that you can continue to go after the life you want. Cheers.